Uh, good morning. Um, just as uh, Luke said, my name is Raphael, uh, one of the members of King Church. So we will continue with a series on Nehemiah. And uh, last week, we saw that Nehemiah came with a vision to build the walls of Jerusalem. And we saw that several categories of people, the priests, they were all working to make sure that the wall was built. There was unity, there was working together. And if it was a key story, the next line would have been, so the wall was completed, Israel dwelt in safety, and they were happy thereafter forever. But the reality was that very soon, they ran into opposition. And what we are going to be looking at this morning is to examine the oppositions they faced, how they overcame those oppositions, and what lessons we can learn for our individual lives, how we can face opposition and overcome them in our lives. So the passage we are going to read is Nehemiah chapter 4. It will appear on the screen. I'm choosing NIV. I hope uh, you're familiar with that. I uh, will read the first passage in Nehemiah 4, 1 to 16, and then we'll read chapter 6, 1 to 8. So I'll start first of all now from chapter 4. When Sambalat, can you put it on the screen, please? Okay, just wait a bit while they try to. Or if you have a physical Bible or a digital Bible, you can. Open one to, to, to the passage chapter, Nehemiah chapter 4, just give you maybe a minute to get there while they're sorting out the, uh, they want to go on the screen. Okay, I'll, I'll start to read now. When Sabalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their walls? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, born as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing upon it, will break down the walls of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all reached half of its height, for the people walked with all their heart. But when Sabalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the, the repairs to Jerusalem's war had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, to stir up trouble against it. But we pray to our God and post a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much trouble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it, or see us, we will we'll ride there among them, and we kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near there came and told us ten times over, whenever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest parts of the wall at the exposed places, posted them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and to the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. When our enemy heard that we were aware of their plot 
and that God has frustrated it, where we all return to the world each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officer posted themselves behind all the people of Judah. Now we now move to chapter 6 and read from verses 1 to 8. When the word came to Sabalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the war, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. Sambalat and Gesham sent me this message, come to us, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But, we, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply, I'm carrying out a great project, I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sabalat sent his aid to me with the, with the message, and in his hands was an sealed letter in which was written. It is reported among the nations and Goshen that it is, says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to this report, you are about to become their king and have been appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this, rep this report we get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. So let's spend some time to pray and see what God will say to us. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that your word is life. And as we look into it this morning, we pray you will speak to our hearts. Come by your Holy Spirit to help us, uh, to minister to us, to speak to us as individual and as a church. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see that Nehemiah came with a vision to build the walls of Jerusalem. And in these passages, we can see the attempts of the enemy to steal that vision and to destroy it. Jesus made this statement in John 10, 10 that the enemy comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I really want you to take note of that order. The enemy comes to steal and then destroy. If he cannot steal the vision from your heart, he cannot destroy it. So the first thing that the enemy does is to steal that vision from your heart. That is why the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of your heart are the issues of life. From your heart is faith, doubt, fear, and boldness, all are things of your heart. And these are the issues that actually control your life. And what the enemy does is to find a way, use threat, fear, and all other means to steal a vision from your heart. If he cannot steal that vision, he cannot destroy it. And so we are going to be looking at three stages that the enemy actually attempted to steal that vision and to destroy it. The first, step, the first stage we can see is, is mockery and ridicule. That is stage one of the opposition. Verse one says, when Sabala heard that we were rebuilding the war, they became angry and was greatly incensed. He was, he ridiculed the Jews. What are these people Jews doing? He was trying to cast doubt in their ability. He was trying to demoralize them. He was trying to tell them, you don't have what it takes. The second question was, question was, will they finish this war in a day? He was trying to put doubts in their heart. Can they bring these stones back to life from the heap of robbers? He was trying to re remind them how enormous the work is. And then uh, his friend Tobiah said, even if a fox runs over it, 
this wall will fall over. He's just saying that what you are doing is of no value. And I'm sure the enemies at that tells you that you have no value in the kingdom of God. However, it, just to show that it's really a lie, um, Ketan Kenyon actually looked at and studied the excavation of the wall, the Himaya, and they found that that wall was nine feet thick. It would require more than one fox to actually fall that wall. But the enemy was just using lies and tactics to weaken them, to, to take that courage from their heart. It was trying, first of all, as I said, to steal the vision from the heart. That was the first stage of opposition. They've just started building the wall. Then we move on to the second stage, the threat of attack, fear, and intimidation. And that is verse 7 to 8. When Sabalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, they heard that the repairs to Jerusalem had actually gone ahead, that the gaps were being closed, they now they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. And then verse 12, and when the Jews who lived nearby came, they told us 10 times, wherever you turn, they will attack us. What I really wanted to point out that in the whole story, you find that they never attacked them at any time, but the threat was always there. So maybe as you are thinking of next week, what threats are the enemy putting in your heart? Or maybe you are thinking of your life. The enemy is telling you, this is going to happen. This will happen to you. But you know, those things, they will never really happen. But the idea is to steal the heart, to steal that vision from your heart, to steal your peace and to steal the vision God has put in your heart. We're going to go to the test the test stage of, of opposition. Deception and false accusation. So that is chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. When the war came to Sabalat and the rest of the enemy that have actually rebuilt the war and not a gap was in it, though at that time I had not said the doors in the gate, Sabalat, they sent this message. Come to me to meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they were scheming to harm me. So at this stage, they moved the battle to a different stage. They were trying to isolate Nehemiah to actually harm him. So you can see that the, the work is progressing and the opposition is also progressing. You can see the persistency. And you can see, and what I really want to point out, I want to point out two things here. First of all, the persistency. They sent that message to Nehemiah four times, and in the fifth time, they came with a letter. And at times you see the enemy, some thoughts go to your head over and over again. The same thoughts again, they come over and you say, God, I have dealt with these thoughts before. How come they keep coming to my head? It's the persistency of the enemy. The second part I really want us to notice is that when we face opposition, it's not necessary that we are not making progress. At times, the opposition is a result of the progress we're actually making. So don't feel condemned because maybe things are not going the way you expect. That God, am I doing something wrong? Have I sinned or have I done? It may not be that you have sinned. It may, could well be the fact that you are being opposed because of the progress you are making the things that God has called you into. And so we see the enemy roll out his weaponry in these various stages. Mockery, radical, threats, intimidation, deception, and false accusation. The devil have always used these strategies, usually to destroy and to kill the vision that God has put in the heart of people. Well, first of all, you can see that in 1 Samuel 17, when the army of Israel gathered together to fight against Goliath, Goliath came and used fear to paralyze the whole army of Israel. The situation that fear leads to paralysis, it takes away your initiative. It, make Israel, it, makes, it takes your focus away from God. And because of the fear that Goliath actually put out uh, there, the Israel lost sight of who they were before God. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do, to take away your focus from God and put it on yourself. We can see the same repeated again if we prophet Elijah when he has actually killed the prophet of Baal. Then Jezebel sent a threat to, her, to him that by this time tomorrow, your head will be taken off. 
But we know what happened. He ran and you, he, was, he, he was in the great state of despair. Really, I really want to say that an underlying factor in all these weapons is to get the people focused on themselves rather than from God. That is all the threats of the enemy actually aim to take your focus from God and put it on yourself, your ability. What am I able to do this? Can I handle this? It, that is all the enemies try to do. And it therefore means that the strategy to overcome all this is to put our focus back to God. And we are going to look at three ways the Himaya did that by focusing the people's attention from the opposition and bringing the attention to God that God is more than able. And so we go now to the three stages. We've done three stages of opposition. There are three strategies to overcome the opposition. Nehemiah counteracted the attacks by focusing the people's attention and the builders on God. The first one was prayer, instant and corporate. So verse 4, when the first threat came, Nehemiah was very instant in prayer. He just prayed, hear us, O God, we are despised. Turn their insults back on their head. Give them a splendor in the land of captivity. Oh, no, we, we don't pray this way, but you know in the Old Testament it says eye for an eye. So he was quite right to, to pray because that was what uh, was the law in the Old Testament. But Christ says nowadays, love your enemies. But he, out of frustration, out, out of the opposition, he was just really pouring out his heart before God. Then verse 9 says, and then we pray to God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So you find that not only did Nehemiah pray, he actually gathered the people to pray as well. Ephesians 6, 18 says about relating to the weapons of our warfare, it says praying always with all prayer in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I want you to take note of these two words, praying always and worship, watch, watchful to this with perseverance. So God wants us always to pray. When the opposition is coming, when you find things are difficult, be instant in your prayer, praying always, 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 and be watchful to make sure that you, 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 it, make, it, it happens. The second strategy that Nehemiah used was to words of encouragement to put their faith back in God. So verse 14 says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. He's a great and awesome God. And fight for your family. Fight for your sons, for your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And then verse 90 says, our God will fight for us. So we can see Nehemiah bringing the people to, back to have their faith in God, using the word of God to encourage them to put their faith in God. Say, do not be afraid. We do, the, the fact is that we must not allow fear into our hearts. There's a sense of personal responsibility, personal responsibility here. Nehemiah was saying to the people, do not be afraid. Don't allow fear into your heart. Jesus said the same thing in John 41. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Have faith in God and have faith in me. So there's a personal responsibility to say, do not allow fear into your heart. Stand against fear. God is with me. God is with me. Stand against fear. When Jesus was going to raise the daughter of, of Jairus, and the news came that your daughter is not dead, why do you trouble the master? No need to trouble the master. Jesus said only two words, fear not, only believe. Don't allow that fear in, keep trusting me. Don't allow that fear in, keep trusting me. So when we are faced with a situation that seems so discouraging, don't allow that fear in, keep trusting God. And using the word of God, the Bible said the word of God is a two-edged sword. So we can see here that Nehemiah was using the word of God to encourage them. But if you read in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus was tempted, you can see that he was using the word of God to stand against the devil. So you use the word of God to encourage yourself, but also you use the word of God to tell the devil, it is written, this is your bound. This is what God has said. I choose to believe God. You stand against the devil using the word of God. You use the word of God to encourage your faith in God at the same time. What was the third strategy? 
putting plans in place to counter the enemy. Verse 9, we posted guards day and night. Then verse 13, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posted them by families with their swords and spears and bows. Those who carried material did their work with one hand and held the weapon the other. He, he had the man with the... Tr- I think this is gone off. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so Nehemiah had a man with a trumpet with him to sound the alarm if necessary. It's actually very important that we put some strategies in place to counter the enemy. So is the devil, for instance, tripping you over and over in a certain area of your life? You may need to put some practical steps in place. Maybe you want to make yourself accountable or avoid certain places or things. I'll talk more about that. And that's basically some of the things that Guy was bringing to us in terms of denying yourself. So what I'm going to do now is in the last few minutes to say how do we apply this to three areas of our life. So we have seen three stages of opposition. We have seen three strategies to overcome. The strategies are to pray, God's word, and practical steps. Those are the three strategies that they use to overcome. How do we apply this to three areas of our life? The first one is building the wall of your personal growth. When we become Christians, God desires that we be transformed like Christ. We go to the fullness of Christ. That is the will of God for each and every one of us. Paul said that I want to know Christ and, ex- and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. That Philippians uh, 3.10. That is what God's intention is for us. But it is not instant. And occasionally we fall, we make a mistake. And, and that is where the battle actually starts. The, the devil will remind you how feeble you are and how valueless you are. He will remind you of all your past mistakes and think that you are of no value. And that is why the Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. He will, that is part of his job. This usually will be in the form of thoughts, the way you feel, thoughts go around your head and you feel not just right. That is the enemy trying to remind you of your failure. Do not take those thoughts. Do not be engaged with those thoughts. Bring those thoughts to the subjection of God's word. The Bible talks in 2 Corinthians, bringing every thought to the captivity of Christ. Reject those thoughts. Use the word of God to fight against those thoughts. If you have sinned, repent, get up immediately, but declare you are the righteousness of God in Christ, that God is at work in your life. You, are, you have hope in God. Actually, I really want to encourage you when I read this uh, passage in Psalm 32, 24, talking about the righteous man, say, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So even when we fall, God is still holding on us. Even when you feel, I'm really done this time, I'm done. No, God says, I'm still holding to you. We have hope in God. And this is God's promise. So Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. In as much as you do not give up, but cry to the Lord, you will be filled. God will change your life. Keep pressing to God. Don't allow the enemy to discourage you. God's desire is that we hold on to him reject those thoughts, keep hunger, keep pressing to God, we will be free, we will be transformed from one glory to the other. The second point is we need to put some strategies in place. So if the enemy is really tripping you over and over again in certain area of your personal growth, personal life, you need to take some practical steps. These practical steps you, you are the only one to actually define them. You know what the areas really are. What are the critical areas 
It could well be that you need to avoid certain places. You need to deny yourself, just as God shared with us. Hebrews says we should lay aside every weight and sin that beset us often. And it's not, you may just think, oh, because you're a young Christian or because of who you are. No, even Paul, the great apostle, this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, uh, 9, 26 to 27. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. So we need a bit of discipline in our lives at times. And I really want to say grace is not against discipline, but grace is against basing our acceptance on the basis of our discipline. So put some discipline into your life for us to actually grow, build the wall of our personal growth, to grow to be all that Christ wants us to be. You may need to deny yourself. You may need to avoid certain things, but you have a purpose. You, have, you want your life to be transformed to the fullness of Jesus Christ. The second area which I really want us to look at is building the wall of your dreams and purposes and goals. As we press into the dream that God has put into our hearts and purposes, at times we have to push through the opposition of discouragement, difficult circumstances, and failure. God's promises are certain and they are sure, but God's ways and timings, they are always different from ours. So and that is why we always face the toggle. We wish it happened yesterday, but God has his own time and ways of working. So dreams may be delayed, Work or study could be very hard. Maybe you find these studies and work very hard. Certain things you'll be hoping for may not have happened. So what are we going to do? Are we going to give up or are we going to stay there and say, God, I'm going to build the wall of my dreams? We find the situation with John the Baptist. You know, he found himself in the, in, in the prison and he said this message to Jesus. Are you the coming one or do we look for another? That is... Just can see at times our dreams are so crushed that we, we can begin to lose heart. But Jesus sent back this message. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. And we are encouraged in Hebrews 10 35, do not cast away your confidence. Is God a great reward? So the things that God has spoken to you, the things you are pressing to God for, don't cast away that confidence because they are delayed. Or because you are not seeing the things you are believing God for. God wants you to trust him. God wants you to trust him. Encourage yourself in God's word. In fact, the people who have accomplished great things are people who have learned to rise above setbacks keep and keep pressing on. This is better expressed by Paul. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. And that should be our attitude. Keep pressing on. Keep forgetting the past. Failure, success, let's keep pressing on to the goals and the dreams God has put in our hearts. And at times, fulfilling our dreams and purposes require we put strategies. So just like Nehemiah, it may require we put plans in place. It could be hard work, because if you read from Nehemiah 4, 23, it says, Neither I nor my brethren, nor the men that work with me, all the guards, took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when we went to, work, to drink water. That is hard work. At times, our strategies and our dreams need hard work. We need to make plans and organize ourselves well. John Maxwell, who speaks a lot on leadership, said that 20% of your activities will give you 80% of your results. So give priority to those 20 activities. We are very used to routine, and it is good at times to sit down to challenge your routine. With this routine that I run actually allow me to achieve my dreams. Maybe you wake up, or maybe the first thing you do is to spend time on social media. What about a day I say, I'm not really going to look at that social media today until I've done some good work. Maybe we need to change our routine in order for us to put some strategies in place so that we can achieve our dreams and our purposes. The last application is building the wall of King Church. Of course, your position was against all the people. 
but it was more targeted at Nehemiah. They planned to harm him. In addition, Nehemiah had an overview of the whole work. He knew where to post people. He knew where to send people to. He had the trumpet man with him. So if there was trouble, he could sound the trumpet. Also in church, we all feel the pressure of change. As recently we have seen in King's Church, but it is more so with our leaders. They face the pressure in their own personal lives and then in the life of the whole church. So just as Nehemiah provided an overall view for building the world of Jerusalem, so our leaders do. And occasionally they will blow the trumpet. They will call for an impromptu prayer meeting for someone who is not well. They will call for a wake up prayers. They will be saying we need volunteers in practical team in case work. We need to respond for us to build the world King Church. It is the cooperation that the people gave to Nehemiah. That was how the war was completed. And so we need to respond to our leaders. But above all, we need to support them in our prayers. I just really want to share these two verses. First is Ananiah 525. Paul saying, Brethren, pray for us. For the great apostle was requesting for prayers from the Thessalonians. And actually the one in Romans 15, 30 is actually more touched. He said, now I beg you, Paul said, I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus, and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with us in prayers to God. We need to support our leaders in prayer. We need to cooperate with them so that we can build the world of King Church and show the glory of God in this city. And so in rounding up, I just, just want us to pray now and, and see whether we have time for our son. But I just want us just to close our eyes, just to um, just think about the things we have read. How are you building your own personal war, personal growth in Christ? Are you discouraged? Are you stuck in a particular place? Maybe you need to put some strategies in place. Maybe you need to deny yourself in certain areas so that you can actually grow personally. And how are you achieving the, the goals and the plans God has given to you? Maybe you need to change some strategy. Maybe you need to just change the way you'll be doing things. Don't stick to your routine. Can you change that routine to make it more efficient and so that you can fulfill God's purpose for your life? So the three strategies are prayer, God's word, and putting plans in place to achieve God's purpose in your life. Let's just pray. Father, we do thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for how you, you helped Nehemiah to over, overcome the position and a, be- a beautiful world for your glory. And Father, we pray for our individual lives, for our own personal growth, for the dreams you put in our heart. Lord, for the words of King Church, that you will help us, Lord, to build well. You will help us to complete our war. You will help us to show your glory to this city and to people with Tarawit. In Jesus' name, amen.